afternoon, evening, everyone. Uh, we're just going to give it a few moments for folks to filter into the audience. And then we'll get started. Hopefully everyone is having a good whatever point in the day they are at. Welcome everyone. Glad to have you here. Um, thank you for joining us for what we titled um, Win is Right, Higher Education in Peace and Security. We're here to talk about graduate school in the peace and security field specifically and when we should do it, if we should do it, how we should do it, and just all sorts of axes around that. So that is the topic on the table. I'm joined by, well, some excellent, excellent folks. Uh, first, I guess I should introduce myself. Um, I'm Meher Akrami. I am the program manager for the Orgs and Solidarity Program at Women of Color Advancing Peace, Security, and Conflict Transformation, which for this instance really just means I'm here to moderate the conversation. Uh, I should introduce also Sarah Westvick. They are the one of the two co-chairs for the Forming the Future Working Group, which is the body convening this today. I don't know. Do you want to add anything, Sarah? Nothing really to add, just uh, really looking forward to this discussion and thank you to everybody who is attending. I hope that you'll get something out of it. And now I will introduce our exceptional panel, starting with Charisse Cardenas. Charisse is the Director of Graduate Student Services at the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution at George Mason University. Charisse holds a master's, in, uh, master's degree in conflict analysis and resolution from the same school of peace and conflict resolution. Her research focused on the proliferation of sex work and gender-based harm in Java and Bali, Indonesia, and gang proliferation in the English-speaking Caribbean. Uh, she holds a Bachelor's of Science in Economics and Law from the University of the West Indies and a Bachelor's of, of Law degree from the University of London. Thank you for being here, Sharice. Next, I will introduce Dipali Animal, who has a uh, is a PhD candidate at the Fletcher School for Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, where she specializes in gender and human security. Her doctoral work aims to understand the relationship between feminist activism, practices of care, and responses to sexual violence in India. She also serves as the co-director of Ecologies of Justice, an interdisciplinary initiative aimed at exploring civic activism, environmental injustice, and intersectional intersectionality. Prior to Fletcher, she worked in development consulting across a range of projects in, on education, child rights, gender, and urban development. Dipali previously studied international relations at the London School of Economics and development studies at the India Institute of Technology, Madras. Thank you for being here, Dupali. And next, I will introduce Dr. Sarah Kurshevs Ahani, which hopefully, hopefully, I didn't just butcher that pronunciation. Okay. Dr. Kurshevs Ahani is the director of the N Square DC Hub. N Square is a funders collective created in 2014 to introduce innovative and creative thinking into the nuclear risk reduction space. She's also a columnist for the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists and teaches graduate classes in nuclear security at the George Washington University, uh, oh, at George Washington University in Washington, DC. There we are, got myself a little turned around with the Washingtons. She has close to 20 years of professional and academic experience in the fields of nuclear nonproliferation, nuclear security, holding research, analysis, teaching, and managerial positions at, an, in, at National Nuclear Weapons Laboratory, an NGO, a university, and various think tanks around the world. This diverse background is a clear indication of her openness to learning new processes and approaches. She has a PhD in political science from the University of uh, University College London, and is the author of Global, uh, Global Nuclear Order. 
and Politics and the Bomb, the role of experts in the creation of cooperative. Oh my goodness, I'm tripping over my words. Okay, so she's the author of Global Nuclear Order and Politics and the Bomb, the role of experts in the creation of cooperative nuclear non-proliferation agreements, as well as numerous scholarly and policy articles. That is quite a title. Thank you for being here, Sana. And finally, no, yes, okay. And finally, but definitely not least, is Dr. Vicki Johnson. Vicki is the quintessential pro fellow, earning four competitive fellowships since her graduation from Cornell University in 2001. At the age of 30, she became policy director of the, the national, all right. At the age of 30, she became policy director of the, at the national, my goodness, for the National Commission on Children and Disasters, an expert body instituted by Congress. Vicki is an alumni of New York University Urban, at the New York University Urban Fellows Program, the German Council Fellowship, the Herbert Skilbel Junior Peace Fellowship, and the Ian Axford Fellowship for Public Policy, uh, administrated by Fulbright New Zealand. She is also the co-founder and executive director, I believe, of the organization ProFellow. Uh, with her organization ProFellow, she speaks extensively on fully funded graduate programs and fellowships to fund graduate school. Thank you for being here, Becky. So that is our exceptional panel. And I've just spoken for almost 10 minutes straight. So I'm going to jump into some questions so that our panelists can be the one speaking instead of me. <laughs> so our first question on the table. Oh, let me introduce first. Uh, we're going to be going through some pre-prepared questions, but please, for folks in the audience, go ahead and post your questions in the Q&A. We'll be going to audience questions in about 20 minutes. So please go ahead and post your questions. You can also see your co-audience members' questions and give them thumbs ups, and we're going to be keeping track of which get the highest ratings, but we'll see how, how that shakes out. But please put in your questions and we'll come to you soon. All right, so our first question is, when is grad school the right move? Pretty straightforward, a really good place to start. Sharice, please. Sure, yeah. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation and, and being among such fantastic people. Um, I'm really pleased to be here and, and give my, you know, few pieces of advice. So this is oftentimes uh, a question that we get a lot. I'm in academic advising for, you know, for students that are graduate level students. And one of the things that we focus on is that everyone's at different stages of their lives and different um, points in time, graduate school becomes pressing. But oftentimes, in our experience, it's, it's the question comes up for a couple of reasons, and I'll cover a couple. And, and mostly we found where, where, you know, students are thinking about making a career change, enhancing their skill sets. Um, they're refreshing their resume. There's some gaps in their resume. Maybe it's parental leave. There's, you know, you know, it's particularly with the pandemic. There's some times where you need to account for um, loss of employment, as an example. I think graduate school is a good place to, to, to use that opportunity to fill your time to enhance your skills. And I think when students think of graduate school, it's usually just kind of the master's program, the, you know, the doctoral program, but oftentimes there are different levels of programs that are graduate certificates. Um, and I think be mindful of those that count towards a future graduate program or master's degree. I think those are helpful. They, they help build skills. They give you a little bit of a theory. They kind of test the waters as to whether or not you're ready for the commitment for a full master's program or a doctoral program. So I think those are important. I think certain graduate schools offer certification. Um, you know, for some students in the field, uh, mediation is a space where it requires certification by certain states. 
So, you know, instead of going to a formal grad school, there are some courses that count towards certification in a graduate level program that I think is useful. Master's degrees are obviously the, the kind of first kind of space that people think about when it's graduate school, postgraduate school. And, you know, many times a master's degree is oftentimes seen as required when you want to have an advancement or to, to get a promotion in a job. So I think it's, it's always good to look at master's program for that purpose and then look at the specific area that you're interested in. If you want leadership advancement to move up within your organization or make that change. And then for doctoral programs, you know, and and this is kind of twofold, is obviously an area in academia. I think it has to be an area of research that you are really focused on. You're expanding the field of expertise in that area. But some of the insider tips that we've gotten from alumni um, is that depending on the organization that you're looking for, look at their leadership, look at the qualifications of their leadership and determine whether or not a doctoral program is essential. And they're saying oftentimes if you're, you know, it's there's some gender biases, there's some, you know, persons of color oftentimes have doctoral program, you know, doctoral credentials where it may not be needed. And the reality is that you need to be mindful, particularly I'm a person of color, you know, as a person of color, that those types of qualifications and expertise may not be on the job description, but maybe something to, to look forward to. So just, you know, and, and I think just generally to have the mindset that ongoing education is something that is just a personal ethos that you need to have at every point. So um, those are my, my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joyce. Uh, Deepali, the same question to you. When is the right time to go to grad school? Um. Yeah, I think I can start. I have an interesting perspective because I initially went to grad school right after undergrad to do a master's and then took some time away, um, worked for a few years and then came back now to do my um, PhD. Um, so I think a couple of things matter and I think I want to echo some of what Sharice just said. One is something that helped, helped me in making these decisions is to sort of work back in terms of what is the kind of job I want, um, what are the kinds of organizations I want to work at, and then work back from, okay, this is my dream position, whether it's a director at UNICEF or UN Women or something like that, and then work backwards and see, okay, what do I need to get to that position? And if graduate school, whether it is a certification, whether it's certain skills, whether you want to take some online courses in gender mainstreaming or conflict resolution or mediation, or whether you need to go back to graduate school for a full-time program. Can you do a part-time program? Do you need a doctorate? Um, working backwards is really helpful that way because you can sort of plan out certain things that you want to do to get to where you are, but obviously know that planning as, as the last three years have shown us planning may not necessarily be helpful when you're in a pandemic and everything is just like thrown out the window, um, is to one thing through what, what is it that you want to do and is grad school necessary or helpful for you to do the thing that you want to do. Um, in certain cases, you can, you can do a master's and get the job that you want to do the career that you want. In some cases, you need a doctorate. Um, Something I've sort of realized in being a doc in a doctoral program right now is to think through whether um, the kinds of research, for example, that you want to do happen within academia or happen in other places, whether it's in the government, whether it's in think tanks, whether it's in NGOs. And in those cases, do you need a PhD or a, or a doctoral degree or even a graduate degree in terms of getting those positions, whether it's in terms of a credential or saying, okay, if I work for the government and if I have a doctorate degree, I will initially have this credential as graduate student or as a master's degree holder and this as a PhD degree holder. And does this mean then that that credentialing opens up certain kinds of opportunities that I wouldn't have otherwise? Does it open up certain lines of 
funding or fellowships or or even salaries that I wouldn't have otherwise um, and sort of think through that um, and know that it it's it's possible I think to sort of grapple working in multiple sectors whether it's you want to be in academia do research or you want to work at an NGO or think tank want to consult for the government um, things like that is to think through I think essentially what you're comfortable doing whether it's going into debt for a few years and not having a stable income can you do you have resources to fall back on do you have support systems to fall back on um because i i think you'll you'll realize if you're in graduate school and you're not earning a stable income and sort of earning an hourly wage or a monthly stipend which is not the same as the income you were earning in your salary, then you need to be able to figure out whether you're able to sort of handle that sort of struggle for a few years or not. And if you're not able to, then maybe there are alternate forms of credentialing or skills development that can still get you into places, or you can sort of kick it down the line a little bit and go back to school at a later point of time. I think I'll stop there for now. Um, and yeah, happy to answer more beyond, the, beyond this question. Thank you, Tifali. Okay, so I'd like to put this question to Sara and Vicky, but looking at the clock, can I, I would ask that, that we maybe go a little quicker because I know the next two questions are going to be really relevant to each of you. So Sara, please, when is grad school the right move? Thank you, Mahan. Thank you to um, you and Sarah for putting this panel together. I'm really excited and happy to be here. Honestly, really quickly, I mean, I think I completely agree with what was both said, honestly, and this may not actually be helpful at all, but the right time to do graduate school is whenever you feel that you're ready for it. And so, you know, you've got four different women giving you different opinions and, you know, so it's not what we say what matters, it's really how you feel about it. You know, yes, there are some positions that really do require a graduate degree, a postgraduate degree, but you might find that you don't even know what it is that you want to do in a few years time. And that's totally fine as well. And so, I mean, there is a good opportunity to go learn more about what you want to do by going to do a graduate program. But one thing that I think is important to stress is that, you know, many of you are probably kind of like, you know, um, already in the peace and security field. Graduate programs, many of them tend to focus specifically on theory. If theory is something that you're interested in, then you definitely go to grad school. If theory is something you're not interested in, you want to do practical, like boots on the ground type work, I'm not saying there are no universities that do that, but very few will only offer you a non like theoretical kind of degree. And so I think it's important for you to know this because personally, as someone who hates theory, I had to go through it. I just hate it. It's so like nonsensical and it's so abstract. Like who cares what people said, what people thought? Look, I care about what actually happened. And so I just think it's important to kind of like, you know, know that if theory is not your thing, then I hate to say it, many of the graduate programs will not, you just won't enjoy the experience at all. So do your research, like talk to people like on this call or like without the, throughout the WCATS network and the Orgs and Solidarity network, talk to people. Again, you might get more opinions, which might find you really overwhelmed, but ultimately the bottom line is like, just it's up to you to decide. You have to, because you're the one that's going through it. We've all been through it. We're not going to go through it again, thank goodness, but you're the one that has to go through it. So when you feel that the time is right, then you know, know that you've made the right decision. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. That's really good advice for many, many things, but grad school for sure. Uh, Vicky, please. Yeah, I'll just be quick. Um, I think that graduate school should be an investment to get skills or experiences or networks you don't have or you can't get on the job. So I'm gonna, I can't wait to talk about fully funded programs. I did my PhD without any student debt. So that made graduate school possible for me. But um, I always had to think about uh, what am I gonna get out of a graduate degree that I can't get in a job? Um, because it is, even if you had full funding, it's an investment of time, um, time out of the workforce, um, time even taken away from your personal life. So uh, think about, am I getting new technical skills that I need? Am I building a network that I don't have. Um, some of these things you can also get through fellowships. So uh, the Herbert Scoville Junior Peace Fellowship was a fellowship that I did that was 
an excellent opportunity to get my foot in the, in the door in DC and the DC policy think tank world. So um, there's a lot of alternatives. Um, so just think about the investment that you're making. Well, thank you, Becky. And uh, I believe Paul Revson is in the audience. So I'm sure he appreciates that name drop. Uh, we also have two Scuttle Fellows currently on the screen right now. All right, so I'm going to jump into the next two questions and I'm going to focus the first one. I'm gonna give Sarah the first pass on the, the next question and Vicky the first pass on the question after that. So our next question is what options are available in terms of programs or locations of study? That is to say, do you need to stay inside the country? Are there other options? Sarah, I know you have opinions on this, so please go first. Thank you, Maha. Well, I have opinions on everything, as you know. But yes, this one in particular. So this is a really good question. Um, I don't know who, where everyone is kind of calling in from. So I'm from the United Kingdom, but I live in America, in Washington, D.C., and I've lived in the U.S. for about 12 years now. So what my, and I did all my um, higher, well, all my education in London. So here's the thing, if you're in the US right now, you know, yes, you've got many options because your country is massive, but know that you're not just, you know, um, inhibited to just stay in the United States. There's a whole other world out there and there are some really good universities out there as well. And so, you know, putting yourself in a different country kind of builds your resume as, re as well, right? You get, you know, it shows that you're willing to take a risk. You're learning a new culture. Maybe you're learning a new language. You're kind of, you know, you're spending at least a year in a foreign country that is a really good kind of life experience and a really good experience that you can take forward with you, regardless of the career that you choose. Now, if you decide to go to the UK and possibly Europe, know that your graduate program, your master's program is one year only. Some of you might feel like, oh, that's not enough, but it's cheaper. I mean, even if you ended up doing a, sorry, even if you ended up doing a graduate degree here in the United States, going abroad is going to be cheaper for you. So know that you have options. You know, yes, you're going to have to kind of, you know, find accommodation, you're going to have to pay tuition, all that fun stuff, but it's way cheaper if you do that outside of the country, assuming that if you stay in the country, you're not, uh, you can't get any funding. So I just want to encourage kind of like thinking outside of the bound of uh, outside of the borders, really. You've got so many options. Um, and as a student, it's very like the university does everything that they can to help you with your kind of visa paperwork. And so that's a real kind of like relief for you. One final thing I'll say also is, OK, if you decide to do a PhD, for example, and let's say you decide to do a PhD in the United Kingdom, outside of the United States, but then you decide that you want to come and teach at the US, in the US. Now, I know this because I had to go through this. Your university, your, so I have a PhD from University College London, which is a pretty decent school, and I went to work and teach at the University of Georgia in the United States, not the country. Um, my PhD had to be validated by the Department of Labor, which kind of really annoyed me because I'm like, UCL is in, like, in the top five. UGA is nowhere even close. But all that to say is if you are doing a PA, if you do a PhD in a country that isn't the US and you want to teach at a university in the United States, know that you're going to have that validation that has to happen. But you don't have to do it. Obviously, it works out. It's just like it just takes more time. But if you do a PhD in the US, you can essentially go and teach anywhere in the country and anywhere in the world. So this is an important distinction for you to know, like if you want to do academia, if you want to teach in academia, you want to stay here, then maybe do your PhD here or do it overseas, but know that you'd have to have it validated here. But equally, if you want to do it here, but don't necessarily want to teach here, that's okay, you don't have to. But the kind of the bottom line is know that the world is your oyster and that you know you are not just like stuck in the United States. There are other uh, universities out there that you know I'm sure would be very willing and happy to have you all. And if any of you have any questions, particularly about this subject, please feel free to kind of contact me and I'm more and happy to talk to you about options in outside of the US. Thank I'm speaking really quickly, Mara, because, you know, time and all that, but thank you. Not a problem, not a problem at all. Um, would any of the rest of you like to, to speak to that? Um, I just quickly want to add yes. one thing in terms of picking programs or schools or countries that you want to live in. 
is to think through not only the program or the school that you're applying to and not think, oh, I want to go to Oxford because it's the best university in the world or something like that, but is to think through other factors like the culture, the weather, things like that matter. So think through holistically whether that's a place you're willing to spend a certain number of years in, whether it's a year, two years, five years, if it's a doctoral program. Are you happy living in a place where it, you know, it's not sunny seven months of the year? For example, if you were going to Scandinavia, are you okay with that? But I have seasonal affective disorder, so I would not function in, in such a place. Um, so think through holistically other factors beyond just the reputation of the program or the school. Oh, sure. I'll just mention one other quick thing that uh, this is something I didn't know early in my career it, is that at the PhD level, when you're applying to PhD programs, it can be pretty important that you have um, some rapport with a faculty member in the PhD program before you apply. So this is sort of an unspoken step that a lot of people, first generation college students, people, even I mean, I'm not even first gen and I didn't know this step was so important. Um, you need to be doing outreach with faculty about what you want to research before you apply. And that will also give you some indication about, um, you know, your competitiveness to get into the program, depending on how the faculty responds or doesn't respond. And that can really make a huge difference in what programs you choose to apply to. So um, if you don't know much about faculty outreach, I do have um, articles on Profello about faculty outreach in this kind of unspoken step in the application process. That's a really helpful insight. Uh, Cherise, did you want to add something? Yeah, I was just going to mention quickly that some students may be thinking about not doing an entire semester, an entire program abroad, but that they may just want to do a study abroad over the summer break, spring break, winter break. Those are really good options. And I, I'm a big advocate. It's Washington, D.C. based schools. There's Georgetown, George Washington, um, Howard University, George Mason. There's a consortium of schools that are together. That will allow you if you are not, you know, in your program, you don't see a lot of experiential, which is completely what study abroad is. Um, there's the opportunity to take some of those classes if so look for universities with those types of consortiums where you can take classes from other programs as well. So I, I think that's that's also helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think to sort of generalize this, there are there are many organizations and and even university consortiums for similar purposes uh, they, they, they exist and can be found I think um, okay so I'd like to move on to our next question and we'll go to Vicki first but first quickly I want to just urge the audience again to please submit your questions we'll be shifting into audience Q&A following the answers to this question so all right our next question is how can you make grad school affordable for you uh, or what are the options there? Maybe part-time grad school, maybe working simultaneously and other avenues. And Vicki, please take it away. Oh, this is my favorite subject. <laughs> so um, I uh, have two graduate degrees. I first did my master of science in public health. I did that in London at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, partly because it was cheaper. I turned down programs in the US because it was a one-year program and it's a really good public health school. Um, and I kind of ruled out doing a PhD early in my career because I thought it would be something I have to pay for out of pocket. And I'm thinking five years, oh my gosh. Um, but then later uh, I was doing a, a Fulbright in New Zealand uh, as like a mid-career fellowship and a faculty member there, I developed a rapport with him and he said, oh, you should enter the PhD program. And I said, no, no, I can't afford that. Um, and he said, well, no, you'll, you'll get full funding if you get accepted into the program. And that was the first time I had heard of full funding. So what full funding is, is um, if you're accepted into a PhD or master's program that offers what they call full funding at the master's level, it's called something a little different. What you get is called, it's called a graduate assistantship. And a graduate assistantship is a very valuable thing. It's actually a part-time job uh, to, to help support the faculty to do research and teaching. And it's exclusively for graduate students. And a lot of PhD students will get a uh, graduate assistantship for the full five years of their program to pay to cover the cost. 
So the assistantship covers, uh, gives you not only a stipend for this 10 to 20 hours of work that you're going to do per week during your studies, um, it also will give you a, hopefully a full tuition waiver. So these awards, especially for a PhD program, I mean, this is something, if it's like 200 to $400,000 in value. So I was able to do my PhD. I did it in New Zealand, um, fully funded on this uh, full funding award. Uh, and I didn't even know. Then I started to do research on this because I was sort of the fellowship queen. I learned all these fellowships. And then I was like, wait a second, there's full funding at all these US universities as well. So um, you can often find uh, full funding offered in PhD programs. And the reason this is, it's, it's actually part of uh, academia. These graduate students are helping support the research goals of the faculty, supporting faculty and their teaching. So it's like they're hiring you. And in the course of that, you are getting your PhD or doctoral degree. Um, and then it, it also, you can get uh, an assistantship at the master's level as well. There are master's programs that offer graduate assistantships. They tend to be research-based programs. So a couple things to know. Number one, you've got to find, uh, this is more common in research-based programs. Professional doctorates and professional master's programs, like MBA programs, and even like MPA, public administration, often don't offer uh, assistantships. So you're going to pay for that out of pocket. Research-based programs, master of science, even master of arts with a research thesis or PhD, you can get full funding. Now there are non-funded PhD programs, non-funded research-based master's programs. I love to tell people about the fully funded ones. So I founded Profellow 10 years ago. We started doing research. Um, I do wanna share, we have a free directory of programs and specifically in the field of peace and security. I mean, there's many PhD programs and master's programs that you could pursue that offer funding. At the master's level, I wanna note there's a couple of uh, key schools like Duke, and Princeton that offer fully funded master's programs and PP and PA programs. You can also find, um, I mean, I think Georgetown has a master's in uh, security that offers assistantships. You got to do a little digging to find them. PhD, there's lots of PhD programs that could offer you full funding at acceptance. So you got to do some research. So first I'm going to put in the chat um, a uh, directory Please note this directory is not exhaustive. It's 73 pages long, it's free. That's why you have to put in your email to get it. Um, but the, you, uh, I also teach how to find programs because a lot of times it comes down to talking to admissions and to faculty about the availability of assistantships, which is kind of the word for full funding, full funding assistantships, remember that keyword. So you can do some Google uh, keyword searches. And I wanna mention in an hour and a half, I'm actually giving a free, workshop for the pro fellow readership about how to find programs, doing a couple Google strategies. I'm going to put that link in the chat too, and then I'll be quiet. <laughs> but let me put that in because um, you're welcome to come to my workshop in an hour and a half or register to get the replay. Um, there's kind of three strategies. And I also talk a bit about how to find uh, ideal PhD supervisors doing some uh, research and to find out which, which programs offer the funding. It's actually a very hidden thing. It's not Believe it or not, it's not very well known that there's funding out there. I would have done my master's with full funding if I had known about this early in my career. So um, I love to share this, especially for people who are non-traditional students, first gen, you know, professionals out of the know. This is something that I'm very passionate about sharing. So <laughs> I shared a couple links in the chat on that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Ricky. Um, does anyone else have anything they'd like to add on this front? Uh, specifically, if any of you worked through their master's program or you know any anything along those lines, sharing experience there. I was just going to add a couple of points. Um, not necessarily working through on a full-time basis, but part-time. So for a, a lot of international students, their visa requirements require that they have to be full-time and that they have limitations on, on being able to work part-time. And so I think being cognizant of, you know, on-campus jobs, those things are, are, are usually jobs that every year Cyprus office people get, you know, graduate. Those are things to, you know, good things to look for. Um, I think just kind of generally and the questions about tuition, just doing the research, as you know, Vicky said, there's lots of 
sometimes their tuition discounts, their full funding, and you know, for some of the doctoral programs, um, you know, health insurance is also included as being for part of fully funding, which is a huge deal. So I think doing the research and sometimes looking at a program, you know, the total tuition um, cost dependent on per credits. You know, there's some good master's level programs that are between 30 and 36 credits. So the tuition may be higher, but it's a smaller, you know, overall um, credit count. Um, We've seen students make the decision to say, well, instead of going part time in the first instance, they front load their program because tuition goes up every year. So they front load their program and then when they reach their thesis or they reach their dissertation, they then taper off and, and start to look for more, you know, part time jobs with a little more substance. So I think it's understanding that funding sometimes is a program specific on admissions. There's school specific funding and sometimes provost offices and university level funding that you can then apply for as you go along. So um, lots of options, but a lot of research as Vicky said. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing the truth. Um, just wanna, to ask? Yeah, just a really quick thing about um, leveraging financial offers from other schools when you're making the decision to go to graduate school is an excellent way to make sure you get more funding. Um, and this is something that I did not know existed, but I was lucky to talk to an alumni um, who said, oh, if you, cause I was deciding between two schools and I said, oh, I got more funding from this school, but I actually want to go to the other one, but the funding makes me want to go to this one. And they said, oh, just tell the other school that the other, that this place is offering you X amount more and see what they'll do um, because sometimes this is what schools know. They know that they're fighting for the same pool of people who are going to go to similar schools. Um, and I did that. And I said, I really want to come to your school, but I got this much more money from another. Um, and they actually agreed. And then they bumped up my financial aid offer. So this is something that works. Um, and it's something that we don't talk about enough, but, but it actually happens. So um, as Vicky said herself before, there's a lot of insider knowledge here or some secret knowledge. So the more people that you can talk to who've been through the process, the, the better it is for you. Absolutely. I just want to add real quick, sorry, Maha, what Dipali oh, just please. said, what Dipali just said, I don't think is only relevant for graduate school. It's also for career, like salary negotiation as well. So I think it's excellent advice. And I think, you know, you should all kind of take it like every, any which way you go. One thing I wanted to add on this particular question was, um, so when I did my PhD, there was a really random um, advert in The Economist about a European consortium of banks that was offering unlimited funding for PhD uh, research. So I applied and I got it, which was great. But like, if I knew now what I knew then, like if I know, if I knew then what I knew know now, you, I was able, I should have asked for way more than I actually got because they essentially gave me everything. I don't think they offer it anymore because I feel like they just bankrupt them, bankrupted themselves. But all that to say is, if you ever, ever come across an opportunity where it's like unlimited, where they don't actually say how much, as long as you can justify it with a, like an, an impressive looking budget and they like you and your research, they will give you everything. So, but that's all in line with what everything has been already said as far as like research. I was just randomly looking through, I never read The Economist, was randomly looking through it and there was the ad just there and then. So just the sky's the limit. So feel free to ask for as much as you want, especially if it's not actually kind of mentioned in the posting. Excellent. Well, thank you all for that insight. I want to make sure we shift into audience questions because I see several and our time is running. So our first question came in is, I think, sort of have to dial it back a little bit, but I think this is an important question. Um, and by the way, going to do this a little differently. I want whoever has an answer to, you know, jump in and answer from here on in. So how did you decide what you wanted to specialize, focus on in grad school? I think that's a really important question. I'll go first. I decided like 
taking time out in between each degree and working and then realizing what I wanted to do and then realizing what I needed to do to advance in that career. So I wanted to what study nuclear policy and everyone around me had PhDs in like science. I suck at science. So I was like, you know what? I'll do a PhD in political science. Nothing scientific about it. Sorry if I've infected anyone. But as a PhD in political science, I can say that. But I, I worked, I realized what was needed and I, I went and got the degree that I thought that, that would help me. I, I wanna mention when I applied for master's programs early in my career, I actually applied for two totally different disciplines, international affairs and public health. And I ultimately decided to go the route of public health because it gave me a technical skill that I didn't have. It was a very research focused um, program with strong and quantitative statistics. And um, that was something I wasn't gonna be able to learn on the job where I had already done some international fellowships. I was already working at like a, a think tank that was doing international affairs policy work. So I didn't really feel, I just felt like the, the master of science in public health just gave me like a technical skill that was a bit more uh, weighty than maybe doing uh, an international affairs degree that was mostly policy and kind of current events. I can jump in. Um, so I uh, kind of closing off the 1990s, which will date me, you know, my age. I did my my first degree in double uh, is a double major in economics and law, and that made no sense to anyone. It was, didn't make sense to the economist didn't make sense, and I read The Economist, so it didn't make sense in the legal field either. So then I did my bachelor's um, of law after that, but but a lot of my career was in contract negotiations and um, collective bargaining processes with, with trade unions. So very much heavy into um, negotiations, uh, collective agreement bargaining, um, conflict resolution. And then there's a huge gap and I, I felt a little bit insecure about coming back. I, my studies is in British-based studies, um, academia. So that's very much kind of transitioning of knowledge, transference of knowledge. Um, and then, you know, working in different types of managerial roles, you just felt like everyone you were working with had a particular type of credential. It, it was time. I needed a break. There was a little bit of a... Um, bit of burnout, you know, thinking about career changes. And then I found the program. So I had looked at two types of programs. One was in Georgetown, I think at the time, and the, the international policy, and then the, the program at the Carter School with George Mason. And, and, you know, that was a lot more experiential learning, lots of opportunities with study abroad. And so it gave you a space to kind of deal with, um, because I think we don't often talk about the reasons why people approach conflict, peace, peacemaking, peacekeeping, and security, is that there's an inherent need or pull to these types of programs for certain types of students. They've had experiences in their life. They feel a particular way. They're very empathetic towards others. And it's, it's extremely difficult material to review. So I think it's a particular type of personality that looks for these types of programs. And it gives you a space to kind of be reflective and to deal with substantive issues that, that the world and countries face. So I, you know, it I took a while outside of my, my my bachelor's to come back in and felt like, which is a little bit different, um, the US-based teaching model is very reflective that I found. And I don't know if it's just peculiar to my program. And you find a space to kind of develop and explore and, and research different ideas, which I found to be very helpful. And then my research just kind of took off because I did a study abroad to Indonesia. And that was the furthest place that they were going and thought that, you know, you have a, a complete experience. You participate in conferences, you do study abroad, so you immerse yourself in the graduate experience. And, it, and now I'm they just I, i'm still here with them <laughs> you know so yeah so it's eclectic everyone's is not a straight arrow it's not kind of linear so i think that's a really good thing to underline and remember for graduate school for careers for basically everything um Dipali, did you want to add something here because i actually think that that would 
dovetail very nicely that last point into our next question, but I want to leave space in case you have something to add. I'm happy to move to the next question. Okay. So our next question is one that is close to my heart. Uh, so grad school isn't always an easy experience, whether that's looking for the program or actually attending. How do you practice self-care or manage things like imposter syndrome? Or rather, how did you for some and how do you for others? Um, I'm happy to start this question because this is something I think about a lot. Um, as uh, was said earlier, I part of my doctoral work is on practices of care. And it's something that I, so I not only think about it academically and theoretically, but I also think about it in terms of the practices that I do with my life. Um, so yes, uh, graduate school is sometimes very isolating. It is also very difficult. Um, and I cannot stress enough the importance of finding your cohort and your support group early on um, is knowing who in your program will be there for you, will let you vent to them, cry to them, um, be there for you to sort of give you, share a cup of tea with you, so on. Um, but also knowing, I think with graduate school, it becomes very easy to have it be your entire life. Um, so finding spaces and things to do that are outside of the graduate program and not feeling guilty about it is really important. Um, so having, you know, activities like learning to cook or, or learning to play a sport that show you progress, because sometimes seeing progress in graduate school is really difficult, especially if you're in a PhD, because it's amorphous and you're like, I don't know, am I actually doing anything? So having an activity that you're giving time to, that you're making progress in is actually really good for your mental health. Um, so I highly suggest, I highly recommend that. Two, do not ever discount the importance of therapy. Um, lifesaver. Um, and I see, and I know friends who didn't, who didn't think therapy was important and then started seeing a therapist in graduate school and were like, wait, I now know that all these things that I was worrying about are actually related and linked. Um, so that um, I started this like really tiny, a tiny attempt called the Academic Care Collective, which is a Google group where we just sort of discuss support strategies and resources and things like that. I'll put a link in the chat. Um, it's still pretty small, but it's in a small attempt to sort of make sure that we have a safe space for people to speak about whether it's how to figure out working with your advisor when your advisor may not be the nicest person or may not be the most responsive. What do you do when you're the only person of color in your program, which for me sometimes being an international student is something I have to deal with, being one of the very few. Um, working in a program where you know you have visa restrictions and no one else does or when you don't know how to publish, you're a first generation student or you're the first person from your family to, to be abroad, um, things like that, to sort of just know that I think the importance of community is, is, is at the heart of how to survive graduate school and academia. Um, and another thing I would like to stress, I think the last thing is to just know that people who've done this before have tips that are helpful and to just reach out to them. Um, and know that reaching out is is important, even though it's difficult. And sometimes it sucks just to admit that you're not doing as well as you think you are. Uh, but I promise you, most people are actually not doing as well as they think they are. And they're happy to hear other people are in similar boats with them. Yeah, all of that is amazing. Thank you for sharing. Um, does anyone else have anything to add on this? Yeah, Sorry, I could. And once again, Dupali, I think everything that you said was just so um, spot on. And I thank you so much for articulating it so eloquently. Um, and also the whole notion of this community, again, you're so right. It's so important, again, in graduate school, but also outside of graduate school. And, you know, as you were talking, I was getting horrible PTSD, like flashbacks from my PhD experience, because I mean, it was, it's a horrible experience. I mean, I'm not trying to be kind of dismissive or anything. 
anyone that tells you I had the best time in my PhD is lying or got paid someone to do it for them because it is not fun at all. Parts of it can be really fun. Like I did a bunch of interviews and that was amazing. But with the example that Dupali gave, like I had supervisors that would just really, forgive me for using this word, they were really bitchy. They were horrible. They were just terrible human beings. And quite honestly, I had no business being supervisors to begin with. But if it wasn't for my community, for my family, for my friends in London, I probably would have given up the program to be completely honest with you. And so this sense of community and knowing that, you know, you're not alone. And the final thing I'll share an anecdote, like those of us that have PhDs, honestly, yes, it gives us this ego. Yes, we have like deep insecurities, which is why we get it. But at the end of the day, what does a PhD say? It's basically, it's telling you that you went through psychological hell just to prove like something really, so honestly, and everyone's laughing because I, you can relate to it. Like, it is not fun. I can't tell you how many nightmares I had with my PhD. I can still remember nights when I woke up in sweat, looking at like seeing a picture of a diagram that I created. I mean, it really does consume you, but try not to let it consume you. Um, and yeah, just want to reiterate the community the therapy and like knowing that you're really you're not alone and we've all gone through it and reach out and if we can share some of our stories and be helpful please 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 uh, reach out Sarah, I, really, I really appreciate that perspective you're going to call me a liar behind my back i actually had a great experience on my phd but here's the here's why i had a good experience because i saw varying experiences all around me number one i did it a little bit later than a lot of people do. I started in my mid thirties. So I had a lot of work experience under my belt. I had a thicker skin. Uh, I knew how to manage my time. Um, and I also knew how to work independently. And, and, in, but, and I enjoyed working independently, which a lot of people don't, that's fine. Two, I had a really great PhD supervisor. This is why it's so important to do these conversations with PhD advisors before you enter a program. Um, because you can get a sense for their personality, how accessible will they be, but you should also ask the other doctoral students in the program before you make a choice. Who here is known, who is known to be like a great PhD, don't ask them who's the worst PhD supervisor, ask them who is a great PhD supervisor, write down those names, <laughs> because um, they'll tell you who the good ones are, they might be afraid to tell you who the bad ones are, uh, just because, you know, gossip and stuff, so ask them who the good ones are, get full funding so you don't have financial stress. Um, also, it's a, a little known a secret that you can work while you are a full-time PhD student. I did consulting gigs with the American Red Cross. I was doing little research grants. I helped my advisor with some stuff. He was giving me little bits of money here and there. You can make more money even. Um, they, they say you're not supposed to be employed. It's not necessary. It's a gentleman's agreement that you can uh, just overlook if you, but you have to have good time management you have to, you should not pick a dissertation topic that is like really difficult to undertake. Like don't say I'm going to do research in five countries for my PhD. No, choose something like feasible, has a clear like A to Z, like this is the steps, have a great PhD supervisor and have friends and support because that is so true. Um, Dipali, I didn't really think about, uh, I didn't have, I think therapy is a really great idea. That's another reason if you get full funding, if you can get health insurance from the university, you might be able to cover the cost of therapy, but I also know if you don't have health insurance or have really bad health insurance, it might not be affordable. So that's kind of another problem. So um, anyway, I'll just be like the, uh, the, the, the random 1% that had a good experience, <laughs> just so I don't scare people away from these programs. Um, sometimes you can have a good experience. But I think to your point is, is that the pain points that others have, when you have the conversation, yeah. when you attend these types of sessions, you, 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 feel confident that you are an active participant in the process and you do your research, you look at the services, your tuition goes towards lots of things, including um, counseling services. And oftentimes students don't understand and know that. Reaching out to faculty, I 100% agree, reaching out to faculty, attending some of their conferences and talks, before you're even considering most of these students that come to our program is because they've met the professor, they've gone to a book review, and so they have a good sense. So you have to have that kind of rapport. And 
you know, you're, you're looking towards the program as a good fit, just as much as that institution is looking towards you as being a good fit. So, I mean, I, I, I hear Sarah's pain points, but I think that, you know, from those hard lessons of people who've kind of found stuff out later on, I think, you know, move, now students that are pursuing have a lot more access to information at their fingertips. I think something that is the through line between all of these comments is that being aware that those pain points exist and being prepared for them is really, really, really important because you can mitigate them and you can work to make it a better experience. And you should expect that it will be hard at times and that there are ways to make that better. And we have about four minutes left, respecting everyone's time. I think maybe we could sneak in one question, but I think we're going to have to be quick about answering. Um, but I want to leave time for that. So I'm going to say right now, thank you all for taking the time to be on this panel and sharing your expertise and your knowledge. And thank everyone who was able to join and, and see all of this. Um, We'll chat about other things after, but I want to get one more question in. Um, so the one I'm going to ask is, do you think that advanced degrees are still seen as giving people a big leg up or a critical advancement in the peace and security field? Or do you see a shift away from putting such a program on uh, premium on advanced degrees? really think it depends like peace and security is such a huge field uh it's so vast it really does depend on which area that you focus on again i don't think that's very helpful but I, if we could get some more narrowing that could be maybe we could be a bit more helpful does anyone else have anything to add there i think that's a good point I think it's a tough it's a tough question right and I think it depends on uh, you know um, which institution multinationals and in, you know they they're still quite reliant on 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 having those types of expertise um, and having demonstrated you know research and published research in certain areas um, state department and certain types of 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 federal, um, maybe, you know, I, I'm not sure. I think it really is quite dependent on the institution where you want to land and whether or not you want to have that level of expertise and the credential that is needed um, for certain types of expertise. I still, I'm leaning on yes, I think it's still relevant. Anyone else have anything to add? All right, well, then we can leave it there. Thank you all once again for being so generous with your time. Um, and yeah, I think we'll call it. Hope to see you all soon and talk to you all soon. I hope everyone in the audience takes advantage of the resources that our panelists have been kind enough to share throughout this. And thank you all again. Have a good day, morning, evening, afternoon whatever time it is where you are.